Welcome to Families for Life with Brian and Brian, a podcast of Oak Hill Baptist Church. On today's episode, we're finishing our series on the nature of the word, part six, sufficiency. Hey, What's everybody. Up, hey, listeners. And Brian, how are you today? I'm doing well, Brian. How are yeah, you? Good. Good. Yeah. I'm glad to be recording and finishing up our series. It's, yeah. been a, it's been a really good series. I've really enjoyed it. I'm kind of surprised that we're like, we come to the end of these things and I'm like, wow, we're, we're done. Like, wow. I, you know, you just feel like you've been doing it for so long. And even though it's only a six part series, uh, we've talked about a lot of things. Yeah. So we could have made it even longer. So yes. you're welcome, listeners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't make it longer. <laughs> Our episodes are a little bit longer. <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, you know. Well, a couple resources. You know, we've been using Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, and so uh, that's one of our main resources today as we've gone through this. We've also used Taking God at His Word. So I would encourage you uh, to read Grudem, but if you're looking for just a quick read, this book, Taking God at His Word by Kevin DeYoung, yeah. is only, what, 120 pages? Man, it's it, not... It's he's, not very long he's at all. So, all of his books are just so good. And he, DeYoung is like, he knows what he's talking about. Right. Whenever he goes to the conferences, they joke about him getting super theological. Right. So just because his books are small doesn't mean they're not like jam-packed full of good stuff. Yeah, he's done a lot. It's it's a way that makes it very, um, I don't know, what's the word? Like user-friendly. Accessible. Yeah, yeah accessible yeah, exactly. for, for normal people mm-hmm. like me. Yeah, seriously, I need that. We've... We've really enjoyed his book there. Yeah, so <laughs> Exactly. So, well, let's jump into it, Brian. We're talking about sufficiency today. Yes. So what is sufficiency? Yeah, this is a huge topic. And so uh, Grudem helps us out. He gives us a definition where he says that the sufficiency of Scripture means that Scripture contained all of the words of God that he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history, and that it now contains everything that we need God to tell us for salvation, for trusting him perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. So those were a lot of words. Yes. Uh, yeah. So let's kind of break this down a, a little bit, right? Well, I think I think the doctrine of sufficiency really, I mean, all of these doctrines build on each other. Yes. You know, we talked about inerrancy and authority and... Um, I uh, can't remember all the other ones, but we, we've talked about all clarity. of clarity, clarity. Yeah. Yes. But five other doctrines mm-hmm. this, and they all, Canonicity. they all interconnect and yeah. they all have these, these webs that kind of build on each other and mm-hmm. help one another. And so sufficiency to me is really sort of the last piece of the puzzle. And it helps us to kind of bring all of this together. Yeah. It was actually hard getting these notes together and thinking about this because it, it ended up, talking about a lot of the things we've already talked about. Sure. And so we might repeat some stuff, but most of it is going to be like a lot of it's really just practical nuts and bolts of how this this works out. This doctrine is very practical because we already believe that God's word is authority. Uh, We believe it's necessary. We believe in its clarity, you know? So now we're saying me personally, the, for me, me, myself, my family, the church, Mm -hmm. I need God's work. It is sufficient for what I need to know God it, and to grow in his word. Yeah, it's and it's it's not just that I need it, it's it's all that I need. Like I right. I actually don't need anything other than this. Um, you know, I can have other things, but I don't need those things. Right. And uh and so and and throughout history, people have never needed more of scripture than what God had given them at the time. And same for us here and now. We don't need more than what God has told us. And so we're going to break down, you know, these, like how this works out practically in our lives. Um, but before we get into that, like what, what does God's word give to us? Like, it, yeah, I mean, it's going to answer the questions about how to live and how we should think and what we should do. So we can put this in terms of, uh, theology, what we should believe about God. Yeah. Right. It's going to tell us all of those things, mm-hmm. all that we need to know about God and about how to be saved and all those things are, are found in his word. Right. There's not anything else that we need to know. Now, last week we talked about we can know things about God. We can know his existence and mm-hmm. things apart. 
but the things that we need to know are all found in and God's word. It is sufficient right. for all of that knowledge when we think about theology. Yeah, there's not something more or some secret knowledge about God that you need to have some kind of fulfilled life. And that's what Gnosticism, the one right. of the first early heresies was, was that you need some secret knowledge about God. Right. And, uh, and a lot of the spiritualism today is about this secret mystical knowledge that you need. And, and it's like, no. God has actually told you everything you need and so uh, to know about him. It's also going to tell us what we need to know about ethics, like how we're supposed to live, yes. what is right and wrong, and, and, how, and how to make those decisions, how to interact with really complex questions about what is right and wrong. And so it's going to give us the principles and the guidelines that we need so that we can live that out. Yes, and then it's also going to talk to us, teach us about a worldview. Yeah. What, how do we view the world. You know, we think of worldview as the glasses or the lenses at which we view our context or view our world. Right. And so the Bible is going to give us that so that when I approach the world, I can think biblically. Yeah. I can think about situations that the Bible may not speak to specifically, but because I have a biblical worldview, I can tackle any issue, right. any subject that comes up. Yeah, because I mean, our our minds. You know, there's a biblical doctrine about the the effects of sin on our on our minds and the way we think. And so, the worldview is is the is the Bible, like you said, bringing into focus. You know, correcting our sinful vision and giving us a, a godly vision of the world. And, um, and that comes, you know, it's not just knowing facts from the Bible. It's, it's a, it's a mindset really. Yeah. Um, so are, it's are really there, cool. Are there dangers if we do not hold to the doctrine of sufficiency? Um, you could say that <laughs> <laughs> as a softball question. Right, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, other views, uh, of the word and, and, People, if they don't do not view God's word as sufficient as all that they need for life and godliness, then what's going to happen is you're going to start adding things to the canon of Scripture. You're going to have this, or taking say, away, or taking away. Yeah, throwing throwing things out that you don't like. Right? Um, they might incorporate other books as being, you know, just as important or more important than Scripture. Right? Yeah. You also have people that will. Uh, the church will become its own source of revelation. You know, yeah. we see this with like the Catholic church, for instance, you know, their words, the words of the Pope, the word, the revelation of the church is just as important as scripture. Well, here's the thing that's very subjective to the time that mm -hmm. they're in. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? And it yeah. can, it has changed to where the directives of the church are actually go against scripture, scripture now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or you have some people that have what they call a personal revelation and they hold that, as high as scripture and some churches will will affirm, affirm personal revelation which to me you know that is one of the most to me that's that's probably one of the most dangerous things we see nowadays is just this personal like god wants me to do this and i can't tell you how many times we hear like god wants me to you know uh leave my spouse and go be with this person right because and that's good uh, because God wants me, he told me that. Right. Or a pastor will stand up and say, God's told me the church has to do this. Yes. The, the church has to buy me a $10 million jet, yeah. you know, something yeah. like that. And that's, that's a manipulation. I mean, right. that's just clear. Yeah. That's clear cut sin. <laughs> right. Right. And so there's some serious dangers. Here. Yeah. I think Kevin DeYoung sums it up very mm -hmm. well in his book. He says of the four attributes of scripture, this may be the one that evangelicals forget first. Mm. If authority is the liberal problem, clarity the postmodern problem, necessity the problem for atheists and agnostics, then sufficiency is the attribute most quickly doubted by rank-and-file church-going Christians. Mm. We can say all the right things about the Bible and even read it regularly, but when life gets difficult or just a bit boring— we look for new words, new revelation, and new experiences to bring us closer to God. That is like, yeah, that's that's just the, you know, there it is. Hit, hit the nail right on the head with that. This is the problem. People want to get some supposed deep truth or mm -hmm. deep meaning when really they're not even living out what God says in his word anyway. And so they go looking at other books in the bookstore they go looking at and now, now again i'm not saying that these are all bad sources but if you 
are not seeking God's word first yeah. and and put the sufficiency in the and the put its place yep. as primary then these other things are going to get you off track. It reminds me of uh, trying to feed toddlers and they're sitting at the table and they're like, I want more eggs. And you point them to their plate and you're like, there are eggs on your plate right, right. now. Not these eggs. <laughs> Eat these eggs. Like, no, I want other eggs. Other eggs. Yeah. You know, like what? So, and, and that's how, you know, sometimes we are uh, spiritual toddlers. And so we just have to be reminded by God, like, you just need the word and it's 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 not just enough it's like more than enough well and the thing that baffles me brian is in going to going to seminary and you know learning i see firsthand there is so much more to learn about god's word i could spend my entire life yeah. learning and growing and never exhaust the study of god's word yeah I, I, I say regularly like that there's a there's a reason why eternity exists and why we are going to live for eternity. Right. God wants us to know him and it's gonna take an eternity to know right. an infinite God. Right. I mean there are scholars who spend their entire life, say, studying the language of Hebrew. Yeah. Or studying the Old Testament or even even the law of the Old Testament, you know? Yeah. So why do we think that we can just do a cursory reading of God's word? And have it, and yeah. then I'm moving on to right. something yeah. else. Like, I know all there is to know. Yeah, like, Maturity <laughs> of the Christian does not move past God's word. Right. Maturity is a deepening understanding and faith and belief and trust of God's word. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's really good. Well, hey, there are a lot of practical things, like things, you know, where the rubber meets the road mm -hmm. in our lives that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Grudem talks about, and we've used him a lot through these and, and just kind of uh, tried to break it down in really um, easy to hold sort of ways. And so let's talk through these practical things that, that apply to our lives. Yeah, so, it says number one is we are encouraged to know the Bible has the answers to our questions on life and doctrine. I, I think to me, the, the right off the bat, you know, I deal with students all the time and, and there's constantly questions. And one of the arguments that people have against student ministry or college ministry is that is that people are not being given the answers to their questions. And I think that that's true. I think in ministry, like sometimes when ministries are not biblically based, we can't give them answers to their questions because the answers come from God's word. But the point is, the hope is, the the amazing, exciting thing is that God does have answers to our big, huge questions. Right. All we have to do is look for them. Yeah, the Bible's not going to teach us everything there is to know about everything. Right. But it's going to teach us everything we need to know about the things we talked about, life and godliness, theology, ethics, worldview. It's going to teach us all of those things. Yeah, and, and it's amazing how much he tells you. It's not like he tells you just a little bit and then you're disappointed. He tells you a lot. Um, not everything, but a lot. And Elizabeth Elliot um, is great. There's a podcast about that uh, her her family members have put up where you can go and listen to Elizabeth Elliot um, talks and stuff. I highly encourage you find that. But one of the things she has said multiple multiple times in those talks is that it's like the presents that you buy for your kids on uh, for Christmas. Um, you're not you don't tell them what they are. Um, you 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 keep them away from them because. Mm -hmm. If you told them what they were, the kids couldn't stand to not play with them. They right. would need it. They, they would get it now. But because they don't know, there's this excitement and anticipation. And and there's times where God doesn't tell us everything there is to know um, because because that's for another time. Yeah, we don't. Here's the thing. We all that we need to know, all that we need to seek is found in God's word. There are things that we cannot know. I mean, the Bible speaks of mysteries that only God knows the secrets that only God knows. But, you know, the reason is, is we don't need to know those things. And in some cases we can't understand them. Yeah. You know, how, do, how do we comprehend the infinity of God? Yeah. You know, when we are finite beings, we, I cannot comprehend that. I've heard I cannot somebody... comprehend a being that has no end, that has no beginning yeah. and has always been. I just, I just can't comprehend it. I heard a, I heard a, a sermon by Kevin Smith where he, he was preaching and he said, God is like the ocean and your brain is like a Dixie cup. Right. Try to fit that ocean in the Dixie cup and it's going to blow it all over the place. Right. And, uh, and but that's... you can contain the essence of the ocean exactly. and you can know 
that the ocean exists that's, in its vastness. That's exactly right. And that's what the that's, Bible teaches us about mm-hmm. God. And it's so cool because, yes, our little Dixie Cup brains can hold the ocean, just not the entirety of it. Right. And so, so that's what's so cool. The, the answers are there. We are encouraged to go find them in the Bible. Right. So the second thing is that uh, we are to give lesser value to every other source other than scripture that we than the scripture that we have been given. Yeah. So this speaks to so many things. Yeah. This speaks to books that we read. You know, I mean, I have a collection of books, and I have some that I hold very dear because they've made significant impact on my life. Mm-hmm. You know, creative Bible teaching has made significant impact. You know, there's a book by C.S. Lewis uh, called um, The Great Divorce that has a, had a great impact on my life. I mean, there's several others, but I cannot look at those books and say they are the perfect word of God. I cannot say that they are a revelation from God in the sense that God's word is a revelation. Yeah, and you can't value them in your heart to the same level that you value God's word. What when what I've always thought and really just tried to do whenever I read these these books is to realize like they're not trying to tell me something other than scripture. They're trying to point me to scripture. And that's the point. If you have a book, it needs to point you to the exactly. word of God, not to not itself. draw you away or from itself. And mm-hmm. this is where the real danger is because other false religions, yeah, the Mormon religion, they they believe the word of God, but they also have other books that are just as important as the word of God to them. That's right. They the Christian scientists mm-hmm. have a book by Mary Baker Eddy that they hold as scripture to yeah. them. That's what we see with Islam. I mean Islam, I mean even uh even the Catholic Church uh, has certain documents that you know they hold just as valuable maybe not more valuable like these other ones but just as valuable as scripture and that's even that's the problem like we're saying you can't you can't have it an, as an equal value or higher it has to be lesser value than the scripture because it's not god's word right so i mean i think if a book is leading us away from god's word it's it's not helpful it's not and sometimes heretical uh, but it's not helpful for our for yeah. our walk with christ there that's are right. books that we can read that are helpful but they must be held at every other every other source, every mm-hmm. other book must be lesser than the Word of God. Yeah. So uh, if you struggle with that, we encourage you to to read better books or to just put books down and read the Bible. Right. Yeah. Number so, three says we only have to believe things about God and His redemptive work that we find in Scripture. So this is really good because sometimes I feel like we can be tempted to believe other things about God that are uh, really popular in the world today. And I think there's just a lot of popular beliefs and we can't help it. I mean, people are just like this where it's like, if everybody thinks it, then it's got to be true, right? Right. If you read it on Facebook, it's got to be true. God is an old grandfatherly man with a long beard and a white robe. Right. Well, the Bible teaches us that God is spirit. He is light. He, I mean, it's God, it's not a form or being Mm-hmm. In that sense, now we know that the um, indwelling of God is mm-hmm. the person of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, right. And like Jesus is the image of God, like Jesus. Yeah. So we know, we do know that God does. Jesus, the Son of God, looks like something. But even that, you know, it's like uh, everyone, you know, there's pictures right. of European looking Jesus. Uh, like that's not even biblical, right? So you know, one of the things that. that one of the things that uh, always bothers me is when people talk about. Uh, people becoming angels when they die. Yes, yeah. And, you know, I I talk about this with sincerity of heart because I don't want to belittle anyone that has this view, but I would implore you to read and understand Scripture because nowhere in Scripture do people become angels. Angels are different created beings. Everywhere Scripture talks about an angel, it is a different created being from a human. So when we die, if you're a believer, you go to be in the presence of the Lord. And one day you will be glorified with a new body and you will ha- be, you know, your spirit body we, will be, be reunited, but we will in no way or shape or form will we be angels. And what's funny is most of the time, almost all of, the, yeah, I can, I think I can say clearly, uh, all of the time, what the Bible actually says is better than what is popular belief about God. So for instance, like we, we become angels actually, no, we become even more glorious than angels yes. because we are created as the image of God. We are a different being. And we even, the Bible even talks about us judging uh, angels. So like 
it's even better than that. And right. and so we only have to believe what the Bible says about God and, and life and, and all of this stuff. And it's usually way better than what well, is it, popular. And all of that comes from pop culture. I mean, one of our favorite movies, It's a Wonderful Life, perpetuates yes, that view. Every time a bell rings, right. an angel gets his wing. Clarence like, oh. is trying to get his angel wings, right, you know. Right. And we just have to push back against that and know that that is that is not true. Exactly. And so that's one example. We have to make sure that what we believe about God and the things of God are from the scripture and not pop culture. That's right. I do think that, and this could be a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I'm going to do it. I do think that. Uh-oh. I Here, know. Buckle I know. up. <laughs> Pause. No. Uh, I do think that we can believe things that the Bible uh, d- does not uh, require us not to believe. I think that there are things out there, and this is a narrow sliver. I, th- I don't think there's as much about this uh, as maybe we would like, um, but there are things out there that that we can say maybe this is true because the Bible doesn't really tell Well, us. there's some latitude. Uh, right? For instance, let me give you a perfect example yeah. about the end times. You yes, know? yes, 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 yes. Um, there, exactly. are, there are biblical views, biblical scholars that believe different things about the end times, and they have biblical backing for their views. And so it's it lies in the interpretation. So I would not look at you and say, I know with 100% certainty what's going to happen in the end times. Exactly. I can look at scripture and I can see some things that I know are 100% true. Jesus is coming back. Right. There is a right. judgment. You know, uh, the order and, and how all these things play out and what, what scripture means by all those things, I don't think we'll fully know until right. we are in there. You know, Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament they did not understand exactly or how it even, was going to happen. Right, or even see exactly how that was going to happen the, until it actually happened. The problem was when they held on to their personal interpretation and belief more than they held on to what the Bible actually said. Right, exactly. And that's what Jesus called them out on. And so so that's a great uh, thing that we can hold on to. This other one is that uh, we are to value Scripture above all modern or personal revelations from God. Yes. Yeah, so we need to be careful uh, in this. If, Like we said earlier, if a pastor or somebody stands up and says, I have a word from the Lord, and I'm going to tell you something, but it goes against Scripture— yeah. It, it, it goes against uh, what God's word says, then that is not from God. Yeah. Now, God does give us personal revelations, personal leadings, but they're always in service to God's word. And it's always, most most always, it's, it's personal for you. For instance, you may pray and say, God, I need your direction. Should I take this job or not? Right. And you may feel God leading you one way or the other, but that doesn't mean that that, that revelation, you know, that that word from the Lord is, is for everybody. Exactly. It's, it's for you. And if God would say, if you felt, God wouldn't say this, but if you felt God saying, I want you to go do this sinful behavior, yes, then you would know that's not the word from God. Right. Because yeah, this is, God is not going to speak uh, something that is not true from his word. And that's the thing where, you know, that's, we've kind of already dealt with this, but I think the point behind this, uh, this application is that, we, we affirm that God does, you know, lead us and guide us, direct us. Um, I don't want to say apart from scripture, but like in ways that aren't directly like you read this in the book. Right. But he never does that. It's in always a way. in conjunction. Exactly. It's always attached. He never to... does it in a way that is, you know, divorced from his word. Right. It always affects affirms what he's already said in his word. It always goes in line with that. It never disagrees with what he got, has already said. God does not disagree with himself. Yeah. So we're not, we're not saying that there's not a spirit filled life. We're exactly. being led by the Holy spirit. But one of the things that's really important, I know Dr. Grudem talks about this in one of his lectures. Uh, he speaks about that when we are walking in the spirit, it is always in service to the word of God. Right. And we are empowered to walk in the spirit and we're able to walk in the spirit because of the word of God. Exactly. And so, you know, there is a little bit of a, a spiritual component to this, Brian, and, and where we, we talked about this earlier, where I am living and moving and making decisions and working and all these things. And there are times where I feel God's leading or I feel God's presence. Say, for instance, I'm in a a meeting and I'm talking, I'm counseling somebody and I don't necessarily know exactly what I'm going to say Yeah, because you get in the middle and you may not know all of the details about the situation. You learn those details in that counseling meeting. 
But because I know God's word, mm -hmm. I've studied God's word, I'm in God's word, and I'm in, I'm praying and asking God to help me, I feel his presence and yeah. he gives me what I need to say in that time. And that's yeah. a leading by God, but it's always in connection, in With conjunction his to his word. It's one of the things I think I was telling you before we started recording was, you know, when I'm uh, praying with my when my three year old son, we're praying and we pray to Jesus and you know we say we talk to Jesus, buddy, and he's like, yeah, but Jesus not talking back, and it's like, well, hold on, actually, when we read the Bible, that's how Jesus talks to us, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, like he just <laughs> like, yep, I totally get that, and uh, but that is kind of how simple this is, you know, right? God does speak to us, and it's through His Word. And when he leads us spiritually, as we walk by the spirit, it always connects back to his word. Right. It just exactly. always does. Yeah. So then we move to number five. It says we are allowed to do anything that the Bible does not forbid either explicitly or implicitly. You know, for instance, there are people that say, well, because God's word doesn't say it, I'm not going to do it. And, and it's, it's not, we're not talking about issues of sin. It's like uh, right. driving a car. The yeah. Bible never says you can drive a car or you can't drive a car, but driving a car is not a, is not a sinful act. Right. Driving a car is not something that, you know, is, I mean, I can drive a car recklessly. Exactly. That would be bad, but just driving a car normally because that technology did not exist at that time. Mm -hmm. So I can say I can drive a car and not be offending God doing that. And, and if you're thinking like, that's not very practical, actually it is very practical because there's a lot of people in our world today that are, they, they will reject technology. I mean, and I'm not trying to, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, dismissive towards these people, but, but like the Amish and Mennonite, like they will reject technology because it's not in, you know, it's not in God's word. Or it doesn't seem to be in conjunction with, you know, godliness. And, and what we're saying is well, they that, don't separate the sinful, they don't separate the thing from the sinful act or reaction that, from that it. people. Yeah. That people right. do. I mean, and we can use anything to do. Well, you sin. think about the technology that we have with the internet and with, um, right. Say, say, because, because of that, the Bible is able to go all around the world yes. through, through podcasts, through the internet. But then also there's a lot of sin on the internet mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. and, I, I was actually <laughs> thinking the other day I was getting ready to teach a Bible study and I was just using my iPad and I just flipped from, I just flipped from one text to another on the opposite side of the oh, Bible. Yeah, and I was thinking, cool. how cool, how, yeah. what, Paul, what would Paul have done right. if I was like sitting here and I was like, Hey, check this out. And I just like pressed a button right. and like another part of the Bible popped up. He'd probably like flip out. Be right. like, That's the most amazing thing ever. Well, and because <laughs> of technology, I know that people that have never been able to get, say the word of God is outlawed in a certain country. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know I'm not naming any names or any countries here, uh, but I know for a fact that they will hide the word of God on a, on a mini SD card. Yes. And they will sneak it into the country in the linings of, of items and, and all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. They will sneak it into that country. And those people have plug it into their phone yep. and have the word of God in their phone. We, we on one of, I think my first ever mission trip, I won't say where, but uh, we took solar charged uh, MP3 players and gave them to people in That's super awesome. rural areas in this country where it was not okay to have the Bible. Yeah. Um, that's, amazing yes. and so we can do and, and that's just one aspect there's so many things that we can do what's great about this is we're allowed to do anything that isn't uh, uh, rejected or, or isn't forbidden by the bible i mean mm -hmm. think about the garden this this has always been the case the garden god says yeah eat from all of these trees just not that one there's only one thing that you cannot do everything else go for it have yeah. fun enjoy any time life. yeah and if somebody would have showed up and said oh well you can't eat from that you can't god says you can't eat that tree but also you know what you shouldn't eat from this tree either mm -hmm. that begins a very scary road of like of like <laughs> legalism i mean that just takes us down a a bad path because people do this even today. Yes. They will add things to God's word and add, uh, to, to where God's word does not forbid something, right. but they're taking what God's word said and they're going even further yeah. adding something they're pro prohibiting things that the word does not prohibit. And you know, that's, you know, Paul even deals with this where he talks about people who will say, you know, do not taste, do not touch, do not. And it's like that the Bible 
does not restrict. Uh, there's a lot of things that we think, like for instance, uh, dancing. You know, mm-hmm. like for a long time, dancing was seen as sinful, and there's a reason why. Is because a lot of times when people went out dancing, there was bad stuff happening. So there was like a, an understanding of like sin happens at these things, but dancing in and of itself is not sinful. And so you know that's where we have to really parse things these things well out we may have personal convictions biblically. and we have to be careful with taking yes. our personal convictions and and making that something pushing it onto other people right right so and that goes with our next point where it mm-hmm. says we only have to do the things that god has called us to do in his word either explicitly or implicitly so we're saying we we, we if some god's word is is not saying it then it's allowed right if God's word is saying it, then we must do those things. Exactly. We're called to do those things. And how we handle that is very important. For instance, God's word says that we must uh, we must read God's word. We must meditate on it. You know, we're, we're instructed to learn God's mm-hmm. word. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say how. It doesn't say where. It doesn't say what time. But if I came to you, if I came to our church and said, you, everyone must get up at 530 in the morning and have an hour quiet time with the Lord. And if you don't, you are sinning, right? That would be wrong of me to say that. Now, if I went to the church and said, everyone must know and learn and be in studying God's word, then yes, that would be correct for me to say that. Exactly. Because the Bible says what you just said, and it doesn't say exactly how. What's good to do is be able to say, here's a good idea. And I could say, here's my example of what I do. Right. And you may want to try this. Yes. But I'm not making it a mandate on you. Because scripture doesn't say that. Exactly. So it's like my personal convictions on how to fulfill scripture is one thing, and it can be helpful for other people, but it's not the same thing as a a command. Um, but but what the Bible commands is. And so in the thing about these two points that I think is so great is that they're really freeing. Mm. I just think that they're so freeing. I mean, imagine you're a, you're allowed to do all sorts of crazy things that that God is like, yeah, go do. Like I think of Dude Perfect, those guys. Um, they're all Christians. They're all Christians, and they're doing some amazing stuff. And I watch that, and I'm like, that's just cool. Mm-hmm. You know, they're living life, and you know what? I know those guys are doing most like they're doing that for the glory of God. They're doing really cool stuff. And then there's this other side of things where it's like, I am not. I don't have to live under this extreme burden of like. Oh my goodness! I have to. I have to do. I have to make sure I'm pleasing everybody. I mean, that's that's what the Bible says: is the the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. And so when people come at you and say you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to say no. What does the Bible say right. I need to do? Mm-hmm. Now that's all I got to worry about. Yep. So that's that's free. exactly right. Yep. So what's number seven here? It's our last our last point. The last here. applicational point is that we are to be satisfied and content with what God has told us in the Bible. We're supposed to find satisfaction and be content, you know, fully content, not just like, oh man, I'm content, but like, yes, this is, this really is what I need. Yeah. And what Grudem says is we should, we should uh, emphasize what scripture emphasizes and be content with what God has told us in scripture. And so we know that not every issue, not everything in the Bible has the same amount of emphasis or even clarity. You know, we, we, we take what's unclear and we uh, interpret it by what is clear. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But that's okay. We still have everything we need to know. And this is where we get into these, uh, we, we call it like doctrinal triage, you know. Yeah, Dr. Muller has a great article on that that a lot of people reference. I mean, I still, I think he's written that like 15 years ago or more, maybe more than that, and people reference it all the time. Right. You know, the issues that we must take with 100% seriousness we we cannot waver on are these first tier issues and those are things like this doctrine we're talking about with God's word mm-hmm. the doctrine of salvation with uh, the doctrine of man you know all of these primary things the bible speaks of of how we are made mm-hmm. how we live how we know god how we are saved how we relate with one another yeah mm-hmm. all of these things are are first tier issues if if a, if a somebody calls himself a believer and they say yeah i don't believe that jesus is the son of God. Yeah. I'm going to say <laughs> we can't worship together. Yeah. We can't be in fellowship as Christians. I can, I can know you and talk to you as a person like right. I would any unbeliever, but I'm going to, I'm not going to call you my brother in Christ because we don't have these primary issues, uh, 
we're right. not together on those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where you start. I mean, it's like water and oil. Like th- those things don't mix. Saying saying I'm a Christian and not believing the first tier issues are not compatible. Right. There's no way that that works. I mean, all you have to do is read the Bible to find that out. Right. And then we have second tier issues, which may be like church governance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, worship. Um, yeah, uh, well, even that could be even like could third be a third tier. tier issue. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, we're you know we're thinking of of you know we have differences that separate us. For instance, there we have Presbyterian mm-hmm. brothers who are separated through church government and the issue of baptism primarily. Yeah. Which which is interesting because I think for some this is a little technical, but for some uh, um, denominations. The issue of baptism is a salvific issue. It right. deals with like how salvation actually works, and that's first tier. That's right. a big problem. But Presbyterians, generally speaking, we're talking about mode of baptism yeah, and mode. with paedo baptism exactly. with children. And you so know. we don't disagree on how salvation works. We disagree on what baptism uh, is, how how baptism is supposed to right. be done. So I can still. Like I listen to ROC Sproul all the exactly. time, yeah. even though if me and him, well, he's passed on, yeah. but if we had sat down and discussed baptism, we would differ Different on that. Yep. But that's a second tier issue to yep. me and him. So we can still Kevin love, DeYoung. love I mean, one another and respect one another and, and work together for the glory of God and the gospel. Yeah. I mean, Kevin DeYoung is a great example of that. Like whatever Kevin DeYoung says about uh, uh, infant baptism. I love Kevin DeYoung. You can read it and whatever, but he's wrong. No, <laughs> but, but I mean, that's the thing. We, we can work together, um, for the kingdom, right. um, but maybe not in the same church. Right. And then third tier issues would be those things that may separate us, uh, theologically, but, but we can still worship together. Yeah. We can still be in fellowship and in church together. Yes. You know, this may be a difference of opinion on the end times, right. You know, right. or worship styles, mm-hmm. you know, those would be, and we can, we can get to, we can get along with that sort of stuff. We right. can be, we can love, love, Love can cover that stuff, no, you know, no problem, or at least right. it should. And so I think it's important to kind of understand that because we we know that that what we have in the Bible, we are we can be satisfied, we can be content with everything that the Bible has to say. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and it's it's funny because I think sometimes, like DeYoung said in that quote you mentioned, like when we get bored. Yeah. And I think that, you know, boredom may not always be a sin but there's few times that I can think of when boredom isn't actually just me not paying attention to God mm. um and so we really got to check our hearts if we find ourselves being bored with the Lord um we've we've got to just go to him and say God uh something's wrong with me I don't know what it is I don't know why I'm bored um but I know I know that you are all of my satisfaction I know that you are all of my joy help me to see that again Help me right. to see that again. Exactly. Yeah. So you can rest and be satisfied and content knowing that we have everything we need for life, everything we need for theology, for ethics, for worldview, all we need to know in living our lives, how to, how to know it, how to apply it is found in God's word. It is sufficient for all of those tasks. Yeah. So all, all we need to do is spend our lives getting to know it and then applying it. And then, you know, personally in our own personal lives, uh, we, we, do not need to add or subtract anything uh, to or from God's word. Right. So this is a great application point for us yeah. just personally is we cannot look at God's word and because we don't like something, right. take it out. Right. Or we're not adding, we're not looking at other books and saying that is scripture right. and adding to it. What we do is we submit to it personally, we live it out, and then we find there is blessing in obedience even when it's hard. Right. Um, and even if we don't, say here's the thing many christians that i know will say they believe this but we don't live it out and that is the biggest problem with this doctrine is we say we believe this we say we believe that it's the infallible inerrant authoritative necessity you know all of these things the Mm -hmm. word of god but we don't live that out in our lives and so that's where we have to be uh we have to be really true to what you know one of the things that that i've always held to in thinking about this is I guess here's the, here's the test. Mm -hmm. Are you submitting to God's word? Are you trying to get God's word to submit to you? Yeah, that's right. Ask yourself in, in earnest that question, because if you are submitting to God's word, sometimes it's painful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes you're offended by what God has said because your own heart 
is sinful and deceit and, and will deceive you. Mm-hmm. And so we've got to let God's word be, you know, be in authority over us. James calls God's word a mirror. It will reflect our true heart mm-hmm. back to us. Yeah. Right. I mean, yes. it will, it will show us who, who, who we really are and it will show us who God is wants to make us. Yeah. Cause as we look at you, I mean, that's how, well, that's how we see and listen to God is through his word. And it, and then it also, you know, it shows us who we are, but then it transforms us from one glory to another. And, right. and our glory might be pretty, pretty poor, pretty dismal, but in Christ, the word, you know, changes us, right. you know, the Holy spirit changes us through what he has told us. Right. Another, so, another application is yes. this doctrine of, of, uh, sufficiency invites us to open our Bibles and hear the voice of God. And that's really that's really what we we're saying right now is like as we hear God's voice, and that's what I was saying about talking to my toddler, God is talking to us. And I, and I explained it to the students like this. You would not have a text message conversation with somebody where you texted them and then never read the text that they sent back to you. That would be like a one-sided conversation. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't make any sense. And when we don't read the Bible, the the Bible is literally God's texts to us, you know. Right. And so he he is talking. He his voice is speaking to us. Right. We just got to listen. That's right. So. so then, what's an application for our for our families? We have uh, God's word would be relevant to every stage of our lives, right? I think that's really important for our families because when you think about family, I mean. Um, in your family, your family is your family for, for life. Right. And so you've got, you know, I've got, uh, uh, an infant and a baby on the way. Well, the Bible is going to be relevant for them as it is relevant for me in my thirties. And then when I'm in my, you know, sixties and I'm a grandfather, it's still, it's going to be relevant for my grandchildren, just as it's relevant for me as, you know, uh, this grandfather, there's never a time in my life where the Bible isn't going to be what I need. It's kind of like there's never a time in my life where I'm not going to need to drink some water. Yeah. I, I even if it. you even if you would study it for a good while, you know, we went to seminary, you know, it's like, well, I'm good. I know the word right, of God. Right, right. No, no. There's a continual need to go back to God's word and continue to learn and grow. Yeah. I've read books of the Bible multiple times and I am still learning. I am yeah. still growing. And part of it is because I'm not, I'm not, we're not static people. We don't stay the same. Yeah. The circumstances of life do not stay the same. So even though I've read something many times, uh, I go back and read it again yeah. and it's breathed new life into it. The spirit breathes new life because of where I'm at right now. Yep. And I think there's times when like you're reading the Bible and you're just like, I don't know how, this is an analogy, you know, where you're, you're spiritually hydrated, you know, you, you've, you're just like, man, I get this. This is great. I, I got it, you know? And so you're reading it. And then there's times where you're spiritually dehydrated and it's like, you get into the Bible and, and it's like, you know, it's just quenching all of your thirst. I mean, it's everything you need. And you're like, wow, I need this so bad. And that's just life. It, ha- it flows like that. And, uh, but we just can't ever get in our minds thinking to ourselves, just because I have had my fill that I'm never going to have to quench that again. Right. Um, that's just silly. That's so, good. so for our families, it is, is always relevant parents. It's relevant for your children and it's relevant for you. And we can't forget that. But for the church as a, as a, you know, as God's family, right. We need to keep tradition in its place. And that's what this doctrine really helps us do is recognize that like every church has its own kind of tradition, but every church should look similar in some way, shape or form, because we're all really being guided by God's word. Yeah. Tradition is good. You know, you you hear the term sacred cow thrown around, you know, where that's when a church, uh, that's when a tradition becomes so important to a church that it, it takes, um, it becomes an idol. Yeah. It becomes an idol in their, in their lives. And so if tradition trumps God's word, we are in trouble. And yeah. so this doctrine of sufficiency all is always pushing us to go back to God's word to say, yeah, tradition can be good. There are some good things there, but we don't have to stick to a, we don't have to stick to a tradition because, um, we have God's word. That is our standard. That is what we need. And I think the way to think through this is like traditions, tra- there are some traditions that 
are going to stick and are going to be around for forever. And that's a good thing because, because they serve their purpose and they bring us back to God's word, right? They bring us back to God. When a tradition gets in the way of ministry, when a tradition gets in the way of, of ministry and, and pointing us back to the Lord, that's when we have to ask ourselves the question, which comes first, God and his mission and the word of God or our tradition. Well, and a tradition may have been started out of out of a great intent Absolutely. to know and to love God and to glorify God, and then over time, it, it loses that yeah. and it just becomes uh, we do this because we've always done it, right. and and it, and then it then it starts getting in the way mm. of what God is trying to and do. Sometimes traditions just need to be livened up, need need some more emphasis or intentionality to be more biblical, right? Um, or to have that biblical emphasis, really. Right. And sometimes, sometimes we just need new things that get us focused back on God's word. That's right. So, and that's okay. That's hard, but it's okay, and it's good. It's freeing. So, well, let's wrap up this series. Uh, I don't know about you. Is there one kind of big takeaway from this series? You know, for me, it's just looking at God's word with refreshed eyes to see it as as significant, not as something just a book, just something I have on my shelf, just something. And and for the pastor, this can get pretty. I mean it can get routine for us because we're, we're teaching God's word. We're in God's word. We're reading God's word, talking about it all the time, talking yeah. about it. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, no, Brian, you need to really take this seriously. Cause what you're saying, if you, if you are believing what you're saying, this is something that is special. This yeah. is something that is God's revelation. God loves you so much that he gave us, he didn't have to give us his revelation, Mm -hmm. but he did. He put this down in the time that we live in, in 2021, we are so fortunate to have the complete written God's word that I can go read it and look at it. And I have multiple copies that I can, yeah, I'm, we are so blessed. We are beyond blessed. So it's something that I must treasure. I must treasure this. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? I think uh, for me, <laughs> this is kind of weird, but I think about sometimes in life, I'm thinking about, okay, uh, w- what is the least amount of things that I'm going to need if uh, in any given situation, you know? It's like almost, survival? Uh, uh, sometimes, and I have to like... <laughs> need a Bowie knife, I need matches, <laughs> and I need the Bible. And that can be, and that can be a lack of faith sometimes. Uh, it can be. But, but when I think about God's word, you know, people have bug out bags, and I'm not hating on that at all. I think that's kind of cool, actually. Um, I like that stuff. But... Uh, you're being prepared for me. It's like, I just need the Bible. I literally need one book and I've got my, my bug out bag for life. Like that's literally all that I need. And so everything else is gravy, you know, everything else is just toppings and it's, and it's good, but it's not the meat. The meat is what I have. And, and one of the things that challenges me is, and I, and I struggle with this is memorizing scripture because, and this is the, again, this might be weird, but you know, we live in a world where where people get imprisoned for their faith uh, all around the world, and I'm wondering to myself, like, would I be comforted by God's word if I couldn't have it physically in front of me? Mm. And so I think to myself, like, do I have it in my heart so that I might not sin against God? Yeah. And um, and so that's kind of a, a challenge for me to to just make sure when I'm reading it, I'm not just reading it; I'm I'm absorbing it because it's it is what I need. Yeah, it's not just a book to be read and to be read and studied. It's a book to be learned and used yeah. in our lives to grow. Yeah, that's right. So I, I'm so encouraged by God's word. I mean, God is so good to us. I mean, just just absolutely ridiculously good to us. And so we just need to uh, accept that and apply that to our lives that's and, good. and enjoy and enjoy God in the life that he's given to us. Be thankful that he gave us his word. Be thankful today. Say a prayer of thanks to God that he gave us his word and then go read it. Yes, that's right. (laughs) So, well, we hope that you've enjoyed this series. We're going to, you know, end up doing some other things here in the near future. We've got, we've got a break coming up. We're going to do maybe a couple pastors perspectives or something. And then uh, we got a little break coming up over the holidays. We need a break. You need a break. Yep. And uh, we're going to spend time with our families and do what we need to do around the church. And then we'll be, we'll be back uh, after the first of the year with a new series. That's right. So thank you so much for listening to this series. And we'll see you, see you next, next time. time.
but uh, I've seen this new, it's like the cable systems that they have where you can bolt them to your, and they have like ads for them. And it's these like ridiculously shredded dudes um, working out, you know? Okay. And I'm like, no. I'm like, oh my, first of all, that person is re- ridiculously shredded. <clears throat> Second of all, he did not get no. that way yeah. on that machine. That's exactly. never the so case. So they'll have like, like uh, the Peloton or whatever. Yes, and they'll have yes, this shredded yes. dude get on a Peloton. Uh-huh. I'm like, that dude did not get shredded on the Peloton. No. He got shredded in the gym. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it's so misleading. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not using the Ab Blaster 5000 yeah. and have shredded abs. Yeah, look at No. <laughs> No. Yeah. You know, like negative 3% body no. fat. And <laughs> no, I don't believe it. Yeah, it's so silly. But then I'm like, wow, look at those. Look at those. You got to make sure your phone's on oh, silent. Yeah, yeah. 